Hello, everyone, and welcome back to yet another exciting SciFest event. These are the kinds of events where we get to involve you, the members of public, and people who are interested in STEM and science and technology and all those wonderful things. And today's topic is one that is particularly fascinating to me. It is space science on ice the life of an Antarctic adventurer. Let me tell you that when people think about space science, the last thing they are thinking about is the Antarctic and they certainly not thinking about space. So we have a very esteemed panel over here of guest speakers. They are all from Sansa and I'm going to introduce each one. Well, I'm gonna introduce them and ask them to just tell us a little bit about themselves uh, in no particular order. I'm just gonna look at the windows that I have in front of me. I see Jonathan, you are on top. So we'll start with you. Would you like to just tell us who you are? This is Jonathan Ward. Who are you and what do you do at Sansa? Hi there, everybody. Welcome. Uh, yeah, so my name is John Ward um, and I'm the engineering manager for the space science program here at Sansa. Um, so my background is electrical engineering, uh, but my job at Sansa is to essentially look after all of the instrumentation uh, that we use at the different observatories, um, and that includes um, our facilities in Antarctica. Aha. Now, as an engineer, does that mean you walked around the Antarctic uh, without shoes on? I have. I've, I've been to Antarctica <laughs> several times. Um, you know, so in order to manage it, you have to know it. Uh, so I started um, my involvement in the Antarctic program in 2011 um, and I overwintered there for a year, which is 14 months. Um, I then went on three other takeovers. Um, one of them, I was the chief scientist. And then when I got appointed um, into this uh, position, I became responsible for Sansa's involvement in the Antarctic. Uh, program. So basically providing engineering expertise um, and managing the logistical requirements as well for maintenance um, and for keeping the observatory running. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Very nice to meet you. And now we move on to Mpati Boleme. You are an engineer as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mpati. Uh, I'm an electronics engineer by profession. So I've been with uh, uh, the space agency for the past two years. I was stationed in Antarctica for 14 months, working as an electronic engineer. Yeah, so my job basically was to, uh, to upkeep the instrument as a space weather instrument, to make sure that everything works perfectly and to make sure that we're recording data properly and it's stored and sent back to, to South Africa. Um, yeah, that's basically what I did. Thank you so much. Let's move on to Thomas. Thomas Chauke. You are you also an engineer? No, I'm a technician. Yes. He's a tech. What is the difference between a technician and an engineer? Um, so the technicians they, they, they do the maintenance work and the engineers they do the design. So yeah, that's a difference. Okay, yeah. so tell us a bit about yourself. Okay. So my name is Thomas Chauke. Yeah. So I joined the space agency in 2017. Yeah. So this is my dad here with the space agency. Yeah. So my uh, I work um, as an instrumentation technician. Yeah. So uh, one of my basic uh, duties is to maintain the equipment. So Jonathan Ward is my boss. Yeah. So I think I got the opportunity to go to Antarctica last summer to fetch Mpati. Yeah. So yeah, that's me. Are you going to go fetch Mpati? Yes, he was there for 14, she was there for 14 months, so yeah, I went there. So you went to take change over from, so did you swap with her or you went to just go and fetch her? To <laughs> uh, swap her, yeah. Ah, to swap, okay, okay. And then of course we have <laughs> Prof. Michael Kosh. Would you like to introduce yourself? Because I know that you are a bit of an engineer, aren't you? Mike, oh, Mike you are Kosh. Um, my background is... Uh, uh, it says I'm muted, but it doesn't... No, 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 you, you unmuted now. Again, by mistake. My apologies. 
So yeah, my background is also in electronic engineering, like in party, but then later I did my PhD in physics. Um, I'm the chief scientist at uh, the South African National Space Agency. So I'm trying to direct the scientists, the postdocs, and the students who do research in space weather and, and space science. And they, of course, rely entirely on the equipment we have around Southern Africa, Africa, and of course, on the islands in Antarctica. I've also got experience of Antarctica, been there three times, I overwintered. I basically had Imparti's job, but that was way back in 1985 at the previous Sinai Antarctic Station. And then more recently, I visited South Pole. So it's wow. very That's exciting and a big fun. I so, mean, that's, that's quite a, I mean, how many years have you been involved with it? Oh, I've been, I've been going, I've been involved with the Antarctic program going back all the way to 1984. So, or even 83, actually, on and off. Yeah. I see, I see. And, and I like do adventure know, and cold, it's a great place to go. <laughs> this is the one thing that, that boggles my mind, and we will get into it, you know, why people would actually want to go there in the first place but we will certainly chat about it. I know we do have a special guest who's hidden away, but I do want her to just say hello, and that is Catherine Webster. Would you like to reveal yourself, Catherine, and you can't hide away? <clears throat> there we go. Would you like to just introduce yourself? Because I know that uh, you, you like to, to be behind the scenes. Yes, hi everybody, hi SciFest. Uh, I'm Catherine Webster, I am uh, in charge of the communications here at the Space Science Program of SANSA. And I, as Steve say, uh, work behind the scenes, helping all our researchers and, and engineers to communicate their awesome science. Thanks, Steve. Awesome. Thank I'm gonna you so much. Away again. Bye, everyone. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to get kick-started. I'm going to start off with Thomas. And I would like to know, first of all, why does South Africa even have a base in Antarctica? And can you tell us a little bit about the history of our presence uh, on that continent? Because of course it is a continent. Yes, yes you're very right, Steve, it's a continent. Yeah. So South Africa is one of the founding members of the Antarctic Treaty. So the treaty is a, it's a global agreement. Um, which are states that Antarctica is set aside uh, as a, scientist, a scientific preserve and uh, research place. So Antarctica has no permanent uh, uh, sit population. So therefore it has no citizenship or the government. So all the personnel present in the Antarctica at the time are uh, citizens from other nations. So South Africa's first Antarctica expedition uh, took place in uh, 1959. Uh, so since then, they continue to maintain um, a permanent research base in Antarctica ever since. So South Africa is currently a uh, base is called the SANAI-4, uh, which uh, stands for South African National Antarctica Expedition. So the fourth uh, indicates that this is our fourth base on the continent which the first three bays were built uh, under the ice, uh, where Sinai 4 is built on the top of a rocket cliff. Yeah. So that's the history of this. Experience. Wow. Well, you know, like when people describe a place like Antarctica, um, obviously it's esoteric to you because you've been there. We haven't really had a taste of what it's like. And, and I fear that if I had to look at pictures or videos, I would need to put my jacket on because you would get cold just looking at the place. So I thought what we would do is maybe start off with a video that would give people a much better understanding of what the place looks like, uh, how people are living and working in that environment. And then I'm going to start hitting you with a bunch of questions. So could we please play the video of what it's like to live and work in the Antarctic? Hi SciFest, welcome to Sunai Base, the South African Antarctic Base. My name is Pierre Tief and I'm the S59 Radar Engineer. Hi, my name is Urani Manuka, you can call me Uri. I'm the S59 VLF Engineer, also known as Space Weather Engineer. I hold a degree of Bachelor's of Science 
in electronic engineering from the University of Pasunata. And I grew up in Stellenbosch and I also obtained my bachelor's of engineering in electronics at Stellenbosch University. In this video, we're going to show you some of our instruments and our life is like in Antarctica. Our base is divided into three blocks. That's block A, block B and block C. Welcome to C block. We start our tour in our gym. We have everything we need here. We have a climbing wall, we have a punching bag, we have a bicycle, we have a rowing bench and a treadmill. We have weights, but the best of all, we have a bra, which uh, you'll have to use your imagination a little bit to see how that's going to work. But during takeover, this is the place to be. We also have some storerooms where anything you might need, you'll find. If you want to wall up a little bit, we have a nice sauna where you can relax. And coming through here, we go to the hangar. As you can see behind me, we have many snowmobiles. But here in Antarctica, we don't call them snowmobiles, we call them skidoos. So we have many skidoos. And the mechanics are currently servicing them and getting them ready for takeover. This is our emergency generator, generator number three. Our two main generators are in the generator room. And we'll go there next. and we're going into B block and in between the blocks we have things called links right so this is BC link and here we have the games room right where all the fun happens table tennis table pool table we have darts so here is our bar this is Chugi Inn you can come have a drink with us when you come and visit here we have the dry store where we keep all our food during the year this is like checkers but you just don't have to pay we have everything here filter coffee Pasta, spices, sauces, milk, biscuits, chips, chocolates. I mean, we have everything we can, we need, right? Okay, a lot of people want to know, what do we do with all our waste? Well, we have a waste room. And in here, we separate metal, glass, plastic, food. We have a compactor where we put all our plastic things inside and it crushes it into a manageable size block. We have a bin where we dispose of glass. All our glass comes in here and gets crushed. We have a rudimentary yet functional can crushing device. We have these uh, oil drums that we use. We cut them open, store everything, and once we're done, we seal them up. And this goes back to South Africa. Well, you saw the dry store. This is the cold store still have some carrots and we still have some veggies left over. The temperature in here is usually about two or three degrees and in here is like a big freezer. Here we keep all our meats, everything that needs to remain frozen and the temperature in here is usually about minus 10 or so. We all take turns to cook. Tonight it's Tulani's turn. So this is our kitchen and Tulani is busy preparing a nice meal for us. <laughs> So whenever we cook, we need to cook for nine people, all right? We have a main chef and then one person assisting. This is our dining room. In the dining room, we have a screen that monitors some of the instruments so that while you are having a bite, you can always keep one eye on your instruments to make sure everything is running fine. And we find ourselves in AB Link. Now we start getting the offices. Our comms engineer sits inside here where he's got access to. HF radios, VHF radios, UHF radios, GPS's, all things comms related is handled inside here. I think you can come inside quickly. So we have VHF, UHF and HF radios and lots of testing equipment. This is also where we go outside 
each link has a big door and this is our main entrance and exit to the base. Now today, the wind's about 30 knots and the temperature is about minus 28, minus 29. So if you come outside with me, you see we have some blowing snow again. Those vehicles there are called the challengers, that's what we use to do our trades. We transport uh, supplies and waste and all those kinds of things from the base to the shore to be uh, either on, uh, loaded onto the ship or offloaded from the ship. We use those vehicles to traverse the ice. Okay, so in terms of accommodation, you know, where we sleep, we have rooms in A block and we have rooms in B block. Currently we're in B block and the rooms here are quite spacious. Two bunk beds, so four, four people in a room in B block. You have your cupboards, you have some drawers under the bed, and then your four beds. So our bathroom's here, this is the B block bathroom. And uh, it's the basics, you have some toilets on the right, you have some showers on the left, and you have your your mirrors and your basins. So this is the Sun Eye Cinema. Come inside. Here we watch some movies, we watch some series, and uh, you know we still do it old school. VHS. Okay, next we're gonna check out the hospital. Hi Abby, can we come inside? You are welcome to come inside. This is Dr. Abby Payton. Hello everybody. Our team doctor as well as our team leader and also a Sunai veteran, S50, S54, S55, S56 and this year S59. She's only, only, she's also the only person to have ever done three overwinterings in a row. Insane. Yeah, pretty insane. I have been taking an x-ray recently, x-ray machine over here, and we've been viewing Pierre's hand. I've got a lovely new digital machine. Moving round to my right is our um, dental facilities. You can see we're pretty well set up there. We also have a nice little sick bay bed, quite a bit of emergency equipment. I have an oxygen facility over here. I have an autoclave machine over here. The reason why I need an autoclave machine is because we have our own theater in Sinai, which is right through here. It's reasonably well equipped with all emergency equipment and um, results of data equipment. And this is our lab. The oscilloscopes, Signal generators, function generators. This is where you service boxes, fix boxes. We do development work. We have instruments running here. So here I service and repair transceiver boxes. I have one here on the bench. And to repair and service these boards, we need test equipment. What we use, we have two oscilloscopes here that we use. We have a signal generator, a DC power supply, a computer running lineups with all the necessary software and we have a router up here, a switch. So using this testing station, we have the same setup here as we have down there in the radar hut. And this basically simulates the antenna array. So how the radar works? The radar sends a signal out into the ionosphere. The ionosphere is a part of our atmosphere that is charged with particles. And this radar sends out a signal into the ionosphere. It refracts, it bends, it hits some sort of electron density irregularity, some some strange part in the atmosphere, and from that it reflects back and gets picked up by the transceiver again. So the transceiver pulses, it first transmits, it waits, and then it receives. So here we have our CTBTO seismic station. This is a system run by the Germans, and it's used to measure seismic activity, specific, specifically nuclear explosions. And this device can pick up nuclear explosions anywhere in the world, uh, including earthquakes. And a few months ago, it picked up the nuclear explosions uh, in North Korea. So here in this rack, we have various types of GPS receivers. What we measure here at Sunai is something called GPS scintillation. So as the signal travels from the GPS satellite in space to your GPS receiver, it passes through the ionosphere and it gets distorted. So we can measure that distortion here, and we use that information to improve GPS functionality, especially here in Antarctica, where the signal gets distorted quite a lot because of the ionosphere. Uh, we are back in a block of a physics lab. So we mainly do instrument maintenance uh, that involves uh, fault finding and repairing the systems. That's number one. Number two, on daily basis, uh, we do data analysis. Um, basically, 
we, we do data review and record events of interest. So number three, um, we do uh, development projects. Uh, by development projects, uh, I mean any project uh, that seeks to improve our current instrument setup as well as uh, data collection, data storage, and data analysis methods. Currently, I'm working uh, on IoT-based framework for our system. This uh, method or system is going to be utilizing uh, the cloud-based data server. Uh, we also have um, antennas for real meter and uh, our VLF systems, uh, as well as uh, magnetometer sensors uh, for all our magnetometer systems. So up there, Pia has already showed you the radar system. Uh, we also have um, antennas for real meter and uh, our VLF systems, uh, as well as uh, magnetometer sensors uh, for all our magnetometer systems. Uh, maybe, let me also point out that all our magnetometer sensors are is, uh, installed inside the, the hedges, and these hedges are actually buried uh, in snow. Uh, so for you to have access to the, to the sensors, you will have to first dig out or clear out the hardened snow. And uh, if you ask me, um, uh, I can tell you it's, it's quite a hectic job. So basically, on a daily basis, we copy data from all these uh, data logging machines to our main server. Uh, we call our main server Mufasa. That, that server is the one that actually you can have access to all the way from uh, Hermanus. Okay, we find ourselves in A block. So let's have a look and see how's water tested here on the base. Okay, we have Tulani here, our base engineer. And he's going to tell you a little bit about how we test the water here on the base. Uh, here in the lab, uh, we do lab analysis on samples taken from drinking water and samples taken from the wastewater treatment plant. Um, here we test uh, for pH conductivity. Here we test uh, for bacteria, and that's where we weigh the samples. Okay, guys, it's minus 21 and it's 15 knots, and we are at what we call the smelly or snow smelter. And the guys are hard at work. Busy digging snow, because that's where we get all our water from. We get it from snow, right? We melt the snow. That's how we shower, that's how we drink water. We have a few of our guys, uh, and you'll see later as well, busy filling up the smelly, right? We've got two big tanks here. Each tank will take about 5,000 kilograms or 5,000 liters. And then we have a big base, uh, a big tank in base as well, that can hold about 37,000 liters. So, yeah, whenever we have a drought, we come, we fill up, um, and that provides us with the water we need. We also have a big bulldozer that we use to actually make piles of snow to make it a little bit easier to, uh, to get it in there. So yeah, that's uh, that's us You can see the base there in the background. We have A block on the far left, B block, C block, and then the helipad. That's where the helicop helicopter lands during takeover. Okay, so here we are in the radar hut, and uh, needless to say, sometimes it gets a little bit cold. We have a UPS here that keeps the radar running for a few minutes at least, and we have some supplies here in case I ever get stuck in a storm and I need to uh, I need to survive for a few days. So I just want to give a special thanks to my buddy Zach from Stores. Zach, you can say hi. <laughs> We're on our way back. We're on our way back to base. Hey guys, hope you have a nice video. See you next year. Bye. Wow.
I, I don't know about you, but that looked absolutely terrifying. I mean, that, that is not a hospitable place whatsoever. It looks freezing cold. Jonathan, first of all, why would anyone want to go there? Second of all, what has Sansa got to do with the Antarctic? I mean, couldn't you go to a desert where at least, you know, your radar and your antennas are not going to be blown at 25 knot winds? I mean, that's just insane. What were you thinking? Yeah, thanks, Steve. That's a good question. And um, South Africa actually has a very long history of doing space science in Antarctica. In fact, even before this base that we've just seen now was built, we've been doing space science um, in Antarctica. Um, the reason that we are in Antarctica is because uh, we want to study what we call space weather. And space weather is a consequence of solar activity. So the sun affects the Earth's magnetic field and its upper atmosphere. And the charged particles that come from the sun and interact with the Earth, uh, a large majority of them actually um, into the Earth's atmosphere at the poles because the Earth's magnetic field lines all converge there. So it's what we call the window into geospace because by being on the ground in Antarctica, we could look up the magnetic field lines and, and basically all the interactions of the sun on those field lines, we are able to measure using, using our sensors. So as you saw from the video, um, we've got two main projects that are run from the base. Um, the one being the HF radar project, uh, which you saw was quite well explained by Pierre, and then the VLF slash space weather project, which is run by Vuli. Um, and essentially those um, instruments actually make up over 80% of the scientific instruments that are at the base. And sort of using this unique infrastructure and the window into geospace, we are able to do all of our science. Yeah. So all of those instruments need to be well looked after. We need to make sure that they're all giving good data. Uh, there's only one thing that's worse than getting no data and that's getting bad data. That's why we need skilled people to be looking after those instruments um, all year round. So they spend 14 months in Antarctica. And when we say we go to fetch them, it, it means that after their 14 months is up, we have to replace them with someone else that's going to take over. Because like you said, it's not a very hospitable place. So 14 months is usually as long as someone's going to last there without seeing their families and, and, and their close loved ones. But I mean, I know that if you're watching TV and you have a satellite dish and it starts raining or it's a little bit windy, the signal starts going a little bit wobbly. When you've got 25 knot winds blowing those things around, surely that impacts on your results? Yes, so the high wind speeds uh, cause quite a lot of static on the instruments themselves and the static electricity can saturate the sensor and cause the data to become corrupted. Um, so, the engineers that are designing these systems have to make sure that they are robust enough that they can a withstand all the static from the high wind that they can withstand uh, the cold and the dryness um, and actually give us the data that we want so we spend a lot of time not just sort of on the procurement and you know the acquisition of the instruments but actually making them suitable for the environment that they're going to be deployed in mm -hmm. Mpati, I was curious. This is a very harsh environment. What's it like living on the base? And, and obviously, seasons might be a little bit different out there? Uh, yes, it's very strange. Uh, it's a very strange place, but also very beautiful. So what happens in, uh, in summer, we, we do not have any uh, sunset. So we have uh, a 24 hours of sun all throughout. And then in winter, we don't have any sunshine at all. And then in between the two seasons, we have your normal day and night uh, as, as normal as we have back home here. Um, hold on, hold, can we just go back a bit? Can we just go back a bit? Yes. You, okay. During winter, 
you have what? No sunshine. No sunshine at all. 24 hours darkness. <laughs> so does it feel like you months? are literally there at like 9, 10 o'clock at night where it's completely dark 24 hours a day for the whole of winter? For the whole of winter, 10 a.m. in the morning, it's still dark outside. <laughs> it's like 10 p.m. So for three months, for the entire three months, you're not, you don't see the sun at all. Uh-huh. And, and then in, in summer? In summer, uh, it's uh, 24 hours daylight. 24 hours daylight. The whole day, no sunset. How does that impact on your sleeping patterns? <laughs> it's quite strange. Uh, what happens, what I did is that during uh, sleep hours, I would shut down my, my blinders so that I simulate uh, the darkness so that uh, I don't, I trick my brain into thinking, okay, it's nighttime, I have to go to sleep. That's the only way, because you open your blinds, it's, it's uh, 12 midnight and the sun is still up. It's, it's quite a strange feeling, but it was, it's very exciting. It's a very beautiful place to be in. So it wasn't really a ploy from Sansa to get you to work longer hours by saying, excuse me, it's the day is not over yet. You must just please carry on working until it gets dark. That's the thing. You don't have an excuse. Uh, you can go outside at 12 midnight and work. You don't have an excuse saying, okay, it's dark outside, I can't work. So during summer, we actually, uh, during takeover, because there's a lot of work that we do during takeover with maintenance of the instruments and the equipment. So we work until, until I remember there was a day that we actually worked until 9 p.m. But the thing is, you don't, because the sun is still out, your brain is tricked into uh, believing that it's still working hours. So you're not really, you're not really faced about uh, that it's, it's 9 p.m. So the work goes on until, until. <laughs> I can imagine that. So now I, yeah. I, I see we've got a bunch of questions that are coming through and I've still got, a, trust me, I've got a lot of questions too. Um, the first okay. one I wanted to ask is, do you need special clothing? This is from Indy Pile. Um, she wanted to know, uh, do you wear special clothing? We do. Um, and you've seen in that video, the uh, Bulani and uh, Pierre were wearing your the red suits. So we have those suits that we wear when, whenever we go outside. And we also have thermals uh, inside. So the temperatures are very low, especially in winter, even with the, with the winds and uh, the temperatures being very low. So you have to wear warm clothes all the time whenever you go outside. So we're fully equipped in terms of clothing because, I mean, you don't want to get hypothermia or get uh, frostbite whenever you have to go outside to work. So, yeah, we do have special suits for going outside. Okay, and now maybe Mike, this one's for you, Tapa Sweeney, and I think this is the same Tapa Sweeney I know in India. Um, she wanted to know, has climate change brought about any problems for scientists that are doing research and in the Antarctica? Well, I mean, there are two sides to this. First of all, we are making studies using the radar and other facilities on climate change. And we do know climate change is happening. Um, it depends on which part of Antarctica you're in, because in some parts of Antarctica, the snow is actually getting less. Um, there is melting occurring or evaporation occurring. And in other parts of Antarctica, the snow is getting more. So the average amount of ice and snow in Antarctica is probably not changing a lot, but it's being redistributed. Um, and I thought I'd just whilst we're at it, when uh, Imparti was talking about the day and the night, um, it doesn't matter where you are on the planet, everybody gets exactly the same amount of sunshine and darkness as everybody else. It's just the distribution. So if you're at South Pole, you have six months of day and then six months of darkness, but you get exactly the same amount of sunlight as if you were on the equator. Okay, it's just the way it's distributed. So it's the same thing here with the climate change business in Antarctica. The snow is just being redistributed from one place to another. Um, although on average, I think we are losing ice. So therefore sea levels are rising and temperatures are rising. Yes. Wow. Um, Donnie wanted to know, uh, do we share the space, uh, the, the space station? Do we share the station with other countries? Uh, the Sanar station is uh, at the moment almost exclusively used by South Africa. 
Most countries in Antarctica do have their own stations. Um, we do host equipment, as you saw in the video, for other countries. So that's also very common. There are a few countries that share stations, like the French and Italians share station. And sometimes you may have a foreign visitor uh, spending time at the station, especially in the summer. But typically, countries will have their own station or even multiple stations. Aha. Now, of course, going to a station like this, it's not like you people put up a, 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 a Facebook post, who would like to go to Antarctic? And then people put up their hand, you go, yes, another sucker, come on over. You've obviously got to do some sort of training. So, so maybe John, or no, no, let's go to Thomas. What sort of training did you do before they threw you into this freezing cold place? You might be on mute at the moment. There we go. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the question. Uh, so uh, one of the most important uh, course that you have to do, it's like, uh, it's, uh, it's rock climbing. Yeah, because you, you have to climb the mast and fix the mast. So, and the mast are like 20 meter long. So you have to get proper training. You have to be certified to climb those masts. So it's one of the trainings that I did. Uh, and uh, the first aid uh, course, uh, in, just in case something happens and you are in the field and someone gets injured, then uh, at least you'll know what you're supposed to do. So first aid, rock climbing. What about getting used to freezing cold weather? <laughs> so, so for, for that one, you, you, you don't prepare. You don't prepare for that one. Ooh, it's like that page they put it out of the manual. They go, oh, by the way, you're going to love this place. It's like a vacation. They've got a movie room. They've got a gym. They've got a braai. And you go, oh, this sounds amazing. And we're going to teach you rock climbing. And you get there and you can't even feel your fingers. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but, but, but I know that if I'm going to a place and it's really cold, my hands go numb, my lips go numb, which, which to, to some people is an advantage when I can't speak anymore. But I mean, if you're working in environments like that where it's far colder, how do you work with intricate things if your fingers are not even operating? Uh, Steve, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very challenging working in Antarctica, I uh, must say. But then uh, with the clothing that we, we are provided by the Department of Environmental Affairs, it's, uh, it makes it easier. Because whenever you're wearing this gear, it's like, you can't feel anything when you're outside. You feel <laughs> is, that, is it that good? It's, uh, it's, it's difficult to believe it. Uh, even myself, I'm like, when, when I was like, okay, I'm going to Antarctica, how am I going to survive? It? But then... Uh, I'm here. Um, I survived. Uh, and now, of course, you come back and then people say to you, oh, Thomas, it's cold today. Yo, yo, yo. And you go, you call this cold? This is <laughs> nothing. And you bring out your lovely warm jacket. I don't feel a thing. I love it. I love it. I'm seeing a whole bunch of questions over here. Um, Beatrice wants to know, is there a crossover period? John, is there a crossover period? Uh, yes, so um, you might have heard the guys in the video talking about the takeover or the relief voyage. That's essentially uh, the three months of summer um, where we sort of exchange personnel at the base. Um, it's also sort of the time that we do sort of most of the maintenance because we take advantage of the daylight and sort of the slightly better weather. Yeah. So essentially, uh, the polar logistics and support vessel for South Africa, which is the SA Agulhas II, leaves Cape Town uh, in early December with all the, the necessary personnel on board. So it's maintenance crew, SANSA crew, weather services, everybody that's essentially doing work in Antarctica. And it'll stay there until about the middle of February. And during that time, uh, the staff that were spending 14 months in Antarctica will be relieved by somebody else and they will then officially take over the position. Here's a silly question. Maybe you can answer this one. Do you guys have internet there? <laughs> we do. We do have internet. But um, yes, as I'm sure many of you noticed, uh, we sent a video recording of 
uh, the engineers that are there now. Um, that's because having internet in Antarctica is extremely expensive. And so we reserve the bandwidth that we have uh, for critical functions such as um, telephone lines for emergencies, um, the transfer of data for real time services. Um, and so there's not a lot of extra bandwidth left for making Skype videos and, and Zoom calls and things like that. Uh -huh. Hopefully as the technology gets a little bit better, you know, we're talking about um, 5G uh, satellite internet, you know, that's on the horizon. I think a lot of uh, these um, communication issues uh, will be solved. But at the moment, uh, yes, while we do have internet, it is somewhat limited in, w in what you can do. So they haven't started laying fiber, what you're saying, under the snow, because uh, you know, some of those fiber companies, they take ages. So you're not, you're not holding, you know, you're not crossing your fingers that they, they might still get there at some point. Unfortunately not. Um, because of Antarctica's isolation, uh, the closest point uh, to sort of, you know, mainland is probably the peninsula near South America, but still it would need kilometers and kilometers of fiber optic to get to where we are. And sort of one of the main principles of the Antarctic Treaty is the preservation of the environment. So we actually don't want to be throwing down long fiber optic cables that might become buried, damaged and lost in their ice. So most of the activities that we do are guided by very strict environmental procedures and principles. And in the spirit of the Antarctic Treaty, we do our absolute best to make sure that we follow those, you know. So it also makes our lives a little bit tougher, with, you know, with what we can bring and what we can't bring to Antarctica. Okay. And, and Michael, what I want to know from you is, um, are there any robots? Danny wants to know, are there any robots used in these extreme conditions? Because I can imagine some of these things might be safer to have a robot doing it for you. But obviously, do they even operate? Do batteries not freeze in, this, in these extreme temperatures? And, and things just, I know cell phones misbehave when it gets really cold. Cameras, and you're a photographer, you would know cameras misbehave in weather like this. So, so what sort of things do you, do you automate with robots? Well, uh, there's very little use of robots in Antarctica. And the reason for that is that humans are just much more versatile and reliable. And you need to have that given the windy and, and cold conditions. Um, and I think, you know, people make a, make a fuss about the cold and it is a problem, um, but the wind is a much more serious problem um, because everything's just blowing around, um, uh, you know, sort of semi uncontrollably. And it also contributes to the cold. You have a thing called the wind chill factor and um, the wind, if it's very high, it doesn't have to be very cold, but the effective cooling rate is very high. So getting a wind chill factor of minus 100 degrees Celsius is completely fairly normal during a storm. Um, but the absolute temperature doesn't have to be very low. So machines, I mean, we see it on the vehicles, we've got these huge great big caterpillar machines and, and, and um, rubber track machines. Um, and they need maintenance, they need to be fixed constantly, because of the environment that they operate in. And so, you know, robots are, are not, not the best option. Humans are the best option. Okay. This is just between us. Okay. No one else is listening. So I just want to know, I know you're a physics guy, you know, the Mpembe effect. Did you ever go out with a kettle full of hot water, throw it over your head, do the, the ceremonial uh, uh, photographs of you guys with all that water in the air at, did, did you guys do that? Of course we did that. And it's interesting because if it's cold enough, say about minus 30 or colder, and you throw boiling water directly into the air, it just instantly freezes into a cloud of sort of ice particles and then falls to the ground. It, it doesn't sort of operate in the normal way because the cooling rate is so high. So how could you go back to work if you could do this all day long I mean, I would, now that would be exciting just to see that. Well, science is fun. That's, uh, that's what we always say. But again, don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> science is, is huge. 
give you the have the opportunity to go to very exotic places with uh, that are very adventurous but you also get uh, tremendous opportunities to travel i have traveled the world many many times to many many places um before the pandemic i was typically going overseas three four times a year and it was all paid for by work because um science is you know exciting there is the fun element to it and um there's a strong element of travel and going to interesting places especially if you do space science because you go to polar mm. you know. well we, we're going to get onto that space science uh you you travel a lot do you need a special stamp when you go to antarctica i mean they they don't have an embassy it's not like you can I mean, I don't know if we've got diplomatic relations with them, but I mean, if you're going to go along, do you just fly there or do you have to get some sort of stamp from someone? No, Antarctica is not a, con is not a continent that's owned by anybody. It's a continent that's shared by everybody. So yes, you have to get a stamp from your immigration officials at the port in Cape Town, but there's nobody at the other end checking your arrival and checking your departure. Um, it's an open continent. Anyone can go there. Um, countries like India have also, in the very recent past, in the less than 10 years, established new stations down there, and nobody has any ability to stop you from doing that. As long as you stick to the rules and use the continent only for science, environmental uh, investigations and studies, and not for exploitation. You're not allowed to go there and go and do mining or prospecting for minerals or oil or anything. Wow. So, Caleb, you want to know about the passport. Now you know the answer to that question. But this is a far more important question, and, and you were alluding to this, Michael. And that is, how do we get learners involved in this field of study? Because as we know, science is exciting, and it does open many doors. And, and where does space science actually fit in the curriculum? Yeah, well, space science covers many, many regions um, of, of science in the curriculum. We need people who can do mathematics. We need people who can do computer science. We need people who are engineers, as you see as part of our panel now. We need people who are physicists. So you can be in many areas of the curriculum, uh, as long as you have an interest in science and you are somewhat more you know, adaptable, um, you can be involved in, in space science or Antarctic science. There's no one rigid track to do that in. You know okay well i'm seeing a lot of questions over here so i'm going to be firing them at you and 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 ryan thanks for throwing them in and freddie as well um if one wanted to go there uh there was a question from eric who said when and where can we apply to become part of the team asking for a friend so so where where does one apply to become uh, to, to join the asylum, I mean, the, 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 um, the laboratory, because I mean, it, I mean, if you think about it, you're committing yourself to 14 months. Is that right? 14 two, months. If you're overwintering, you're committing to yourself to 14 months, actually a two year contract, because there's some training and debriefing. Um, but you can also go as a volunteer just for the three month takeover period. And Sansa advertises, we advertise on our webpage, um, typically, these sort of adverts for volunteers would come out around August time. So people go and look under vacancies or opportunities on the SANSA webpage. They can see these adverts. So obviously, we have special requirements for, and, and interviews for people who go for the winter because they have to be able to do work um, of a technical nature. But for the volunteers, there's less of a requirement. And uh, we would typically take up to three volunteers or less depending on the number of births and the need on the ship. And these are often people who are members of the public who can go just to get a, a feel and a taste for the station and the type of things that we're doing. So people, there are opportunities, just go to the SANSA webpage and look for the job adverts. That is interesting. So people, if you are interested to go, um, apparently they do take in-laws. Um, you are welcome to sign up family members and they will come and collect them from your doorstep and take them all the way to Antarctic. And remember, the internet is bad, so you won't be able to communicate on a frequent basis. Um, we, we do bring them back. They all come back, by the way. 
<laughs> Apparently they always do. Um, yeah, we don't take Thomas... the in-laws and leave them there. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, I wanted to know, um, do they have quality control? This is from Donnie on people's cooking skills. Because if you are there, you said that there was one chef. Does that mean it is their task to be the chef and, and everyone has a chance to help? Or is this a scientist who happened to have some skills in cooking? Because we know what engineers are like when they make food. It's not the same as the cooking channel. What were you going to say about that, Thomas? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it's a... Uh, um... So for the, for the team that is going there for 14 months, they do like a cooking course. So those ones that are well equipped when it comes to cooking. So they'll help each other with the cooking. Maybe they'll cook in a group of, of two. But then during our takeover, like when we go there in December, we, we go there with the chef. So the chef will be doing the cooking for us. Well, that's very helpful. I like that. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, I'm going to throw a tough one at you. This one comes from Tandile. If you would have to convince decision makers, particularly politicians, into more funding for your project, what would be the key message that you would focus on with regards to the importance of the SANA base? And can you put that in layman's terms? Okay, I'll try. Um, <laughs> look, I think the Antarctic station, I mean, like, it is a strategic asset. It is of huge import. Uh, it's of huge national importance to the country, not just because of the science, but sort of maintaining a presence in Antarctica um, in support of the treaty is also very important. Sort of what I would tell them to try and solicit more funding is that I would sort of speak to the national benefit of the programs that we are running um, here. We do a lot of very critical work for a number of sectors, uh, space, science, and technology. Um, so, sorry, space science affects a lot of our technological systems, both in space and on the ground. And sort of as the world and South Africa is moving into sort of a new technological space, you know, we're talking about the internet of things, we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution, um, the integration of technology into sort of our daily lives, all of those technologies are susceptible to space weather. So the more we study and understand uh, the effects of space weather on our technological systems, the better that, you know, that we can protect our systems and mitigate against losses. For example, our electrical power grid is highly susceptible to what we call geomagnetically induced currents. That is when solar activity um, moves the Earth's magnetic field in such a way that currents are induced on high voltage power lines. And if we don't monitor that carefully, and if we don't understand that carefully, that can actually cause the failure of the transmission line and cause economic disruption to the area that that power line was serving. Um, the effects are also seen in, in the aviation industry. Um, anything that needs satellite navigation, anything that needs satellite communication. So as we are so dependent now on this type of technology, it's more and more important that we protect it. So that's the message that I would give is that we need funding so that we can improve and enhance our research um, and that we can better understand these things to protect our economy and our livelihoods. Okay, now I'm gonna throw some Quick questions at you. They, they're probably not quick answers, but uh, Tapasweeney wants to know, has the magnetic poles shift made you change your magnetic models? So whoever wants to answer that one, put up your hand and we'll give it to you first. I'm going to throw that to Mike straight away. Okay, Mike, you know what it is? They always put you the in the answer is yes. questions. The answer is yes. Uh, we have a geomagnetism team and we update the magnetic field model every six months. And that's okay. Really, well, that is that it's uh, very important because um, aircraft navigation still relies on the magnetic field. Believe it or not, aircraft uh, use compasses to fly. They do not rely on satellite navigation for flight, although they do use it. Okay. Uh, how much is the salary for this career? So this is clearly 
coming from people who are going, you know, this kind of appeals to me. I want to get away from my family. I want to go to a place where it's freezing cold and I can make some money because I can't spend it anywhere there. They've got a big checkers where you don't have to spend money and a video, a VHS library of movies. Think, I mean, this is just crazy. So how much money do people make doing these sorts of things? John, I think you best to answer that, please. I don't want to get into trouble with human resources, so I'm not going to throw out a number. But, but could you give us a range? Salary um, is linked, obviously, to qualifications. Um, but um, due to sort of uh, the unique nature of the position, um, the salary is highly competitive, um, you know, compared to to other other frozen places in the world. Job that you would have in South Africa. Um, but I can add that the advantage of going to Antarctica is that sort of all your expenses are paid for while you're there. So you do actually, you, your take home will actually be more because you're stationed away from home. You don't have to pay for your, for your rent or your food or your medical or anything like that, you know? So it's more for your family and it's more for you. At, at that the is end correct. There's a bonus and you basically have zero expenditure. So you know, it's a great way to save money and pay off any debts, et cetera, et cetera. All right, here's another one, Mbati. I noticed in the video, they had fresh fruit and vegetables on the table in the kitchen. But how often are these boats coming to replenish those fresh fruit and vegetables and how do you keep them fresh for so long? Uh, so we only have, uh, at the beginning of the year, during takeover in December, that's the only time that we get uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. So um, the ship bring it bring in uh, all the, the supplies that will last for the whole year. So the fresh fruits and vegetables don't last for very long. We usually we survive on uh, frozen foods. So I think uh, our fresh vegetables only lasted until maybe uh, April, maybe May. And then from May onwards, it's just frozen vegetables and 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 and, and uh, yeah, and food. <laughs> okay, so we don't so get a, we, we don't get a supply during the year. It's just from the beginning of the year, which supposedly should last for the for the whole year. Yeah, so so I get what's going on. They they take the honeymoon photographs, the video footage, to make it look appealing, but the rest of it is just eating out of cans. And okay, I get what's going on here. Uh, now, it's really, it's really not that bad. It's not, it's really oh. not that bad. I mean, <laughs> Hannah, I'm just I'm giving you a tough time. I'm giving you a tough time. Now, I, I mean, I'm really getting so many questions over here. Two very interesting questions. Um, is there any chance for a person working in literature and the arts to winter in the Antarctica? And that's from Carol. I'm thinking maybe people want to write a book. Maybe people who are artists, maybe people who are going to document what's going on. I mean, do you have non sciencey people coming along? Uh, at the moment, we only have nine people overwintering. Uh, it's, uh, we have two uh, diesel mechanical engineers. We have one mechanical engineer. We have two electronics engineers. We have a meteorologist and we have a doctor and then a communications engineer. So I, I don't know if things will change maybe in the future, but at the moment, those are the only nine people that can overwinter. But mm. however, during the summer, during the my club, the people that uh, I think maybe we'll talk more on that, on what kind of qualifications they require for people who will volunteer. But as Mike said, it's not very strict for the volunteering position. So maybe that is uh, the kind of post that people would, would want to, somebody who's not in the engineering field or any of the nine uh, positions that I mentioned could uh, apply for. Yeah. Well, Carol, I can let you do a little secret. If I had to go to Antarctica and I was painting, there we go. That would be my latest painting. It's just snow. There's nothing much to paint. <laughs> what were you thinking? So now I have a question from Millie Pup over there in Nirenstein. Do you see any animals? And I'm going to put this to Mike because I know you are a photographer. You, that's one of your hobbies. What sort of creatures do you see out there and which creatures are crazy enough to stay out there? 
Well, one myth that we can cancel straight away is that there are no polar bears in Antarctica. The polar bears are in the north only. Um, animals such as they exist normally would be near the coast only, so seals and penguins. There are birds, but there really aren't any mammals in the sense that they are reindeer or polar bear or anything along those lines. And the wildlife such that it exists is very plentiful, but it's mainly aligned to being on the coast where the water is. So penguins? Definitely. Whales and dolphins? Sorry? Whales? Whales, definitely, yes, yes. And have you got any good shots? Did you, do you take photographs of them? Well, from the ship, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't going to be getting into the water to try and take pictures of them. And, and uh, then the other one, the other question that was thrown at me is if you are an electronic engineer, this from Petrus, uh, in the winter there, what does your schedule look like? Do you have time for a PhD or extra R&D work? So here's someone who's seriously contemplating this. You can hear it, the inner workings. If I go there, I don't have to spend money. Uh, could I still do research? The internet is awful. I'm just telling you now. Yeah? So... <laughs> What would you have to say to that? Uh, I don't know if John wants to take this one. Yeah, I want I can take you take it, please. Um, so, yes. I mean, like the short answer is yes. Um, so most of the more sort of routine activities is, in, is involving sort of making sure that the systems are healthy and that if any maintenance needs to take place, that it gets sort of done in a timely fashion. But... Outside of that, uh, you are actually free to do sort of any other work that you would like. So a lot of the engineers uh, do some um, d d development work on the existing systems because they might, while they're working with them, feel that they can do some kind of optimization. And so they work on that. Um, others sort of, yeah, you know, they might be studying towards a degree um, in my experience, which is almost 10 years now, those that try to study a master's or a PhD while deployed at the Antarctic Station don't manage to find much time because there's actually a lot else to do besides your normal duties. But if you're highly motivated, yes, you would definitely have the time to do it. Yeah. But in reality, I mean, there is a VHS library and, and, and you also have to uh, deal with the cold. So you would be very busy dealing with a lot of important things there. Uh, so you wouldn't be able to do your PhD. But now, I, I mean, I appreciate you, Beatrice, that, that you were showing enthusiasm. Uh, Thomas, this is a quick question for you. Uh, someone wants to know what happens if you get seriously ill? I think this one is an easy one to answer. Uh, so as, as, as you saw on the, on the, on the video, uh, there's a doctor, but then if it's serious, like critical, uh, then uh, I think they'll send they'll send a flight to come and fetch you. Oh, so they can fly into they can fly to Antarctica. Yes, they can fly to Antarctica. It's possible. I see. I see. And uh, thank you, Paul. That was a great question. And then, of course, Tapasweeney wants to know: Do the scientists feel the after effects of prolonged research there? That's an interesting question. Ah, uh, I think Michael will take this one. <laughs> you see how they throw it, Michael. So you just say, what type of research was that again? So, so the question was, um, do scientists feel the after effects of prolonged research there? So if you are doing prolonged research, are there any after effects for, for that, that long period of time? Well, I don't, well, um, um, Look, spending a year with a very small number of other individuals in a rather isolated location, even though nowadays you have internet, and in the past we didn't have it, um, there are some, there are some um, after effects, but they don't last. I mean, look at Imparti. She looks completely normal to me, and she, <laughs> she's back a few months. So, no, um, uh, the type of person who goes there is the type of person who wants to go there. And if you um, pass all the tests necessary to go, then you're, you're fit enough uh, physically and also mentally and psychologically to go there, have the adventure of a lifetime and come back and be a perfectly normal person. If you don't want to go there, then you shouldn't go. 
because you're going to have a miserable experience. Yes. I mean, look, when they talk about settling on Mars, they build these analog stations all over the world in different environments. This is effectively like a, a, a simulation of living in a harsh environment and, and living with people in a confined space over a prolonged period. I mean, it's, it, 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 it does take its toll on you. You can't walk yeah. outside and say, I'm not talking to you anymore. I'm going outside because then you, you're cutting off your nose. Actually, your nose will fall off anyway from the frostbite. Listen, I mean, obviously you're a human being and obviously there's going to be disagreements and there's going to be arguments. But the type of people we're sending down there are the sort of people who can cope with the situation and are also reasonable and will come to the necessary compromise leadership uh, is useful. So it's very rare that we have a situation where there's a complete meltdown. Um, first of all, people know that um, the ship is coming. They're going to be there for 14 months, so they, they will eventually leave. Um, people also know that unless it's a dire medical emergency, they're not going to send a flight down there just mm -hmm. to because you want to go home. Because these flights are extraordinarily expensive. We're talking something like 15 million rand to send a flight to pick someone up. Wow. Um, so we would only do that in a life-threatening situation. So the people we're sending down, we have assessed them that they, and as a general rule, it's, it's true. They all manage to cope. You know? Wow. Okay, so I've got a couple quick ones. Let's have a look over here. Uh, Miller wants to know, do you ever see your family? So obviously if Skype and things are safe for research, then does that mean you get allocated short amounts of time to, to speak to the family? Imparti, do you want to answer that, please? Yes, uh, so we do, we do get time to talk to our family because um, we have internet. So what we usually do, we, we had phone calls, which is uh, much easier to do than uh, video calls. But sometimes we did get a chance to, to do WhatsApp calls, video calls. But uh, obviously, it, it should be for a limited uh, time because now you don't want to uh, restrict everybody else because the, the internet is not very very strong and uh, there's not abundant uh, bandwidth. Mm -hmm. so, but we do talk, I did talk to my family a lot, almost every day, phone calls, uh, WhatsApp. So you're not uh, completely isolated. You still right. get to see them. <laughs> and, and, and then another question from Indy Pila was about what happens if you have a freak snowstorm where we're talking extreme weather and you get completely snowed in? Do you ever worry? Because I've seen some of those movies. I know they exaggerate a little bit. You know, the, the warning signs and the scientists are telling everyone, be careful. But I mean, what happens when you have that entire place covered in snow and you actually can't even dig yourself out? Are you ever worried that there could be a, a situation like that? Yeah, this is something that you think about uh, when you go there, when you don't know what to expect. Um, but the, the base is built in such a way that it can withstand such conditions. So as Thomas explained earlier, it's, it's built on sensors. So it is, um, it's not on, on, on the surface of the, 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 the ants. So it's, it's not possible for, it's not, uh, it hasn't happened yet, but the, the base is covered in snow. The, it's pretty, it's, uh, the temperature in the base is regulated, it's warm. So you don't really, can't feel the, the cold temperature outside because the base itself is warm. We've had pretty big storms uh, during my time there and where you can actually feel the base moving, where you get scared, like, what's going to happen? Now? Is it gonna, what's going to happen? But the base is very strong. It's built in such a way to withstand such conditions. Okay. Three more questions. Let's see. One, do you see auroras and is the night sky great to look at because there's obviously no light pollution? Yes, uh, we were fortunate enough to see the auroras uh, during winter. I remember it was, it was just one night. Um, I, I, I must have sat out there for like almost an hour just sitting and just watching and just looking at the sky. It's such a, a beautiful experience. It's very, very beautiful. And uh, it's, yeah, I can't, <laughs> it's not very easy to explain it to somebody who's never actually seen it, but it's, it's very beautiful. But it made it all the worthwhile to see that. 
It did. It did, yes. <laughs> and the night sky uh, was changing. Life changing. Oh, yes, is it? Yes, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I and, remember and, we were joking yeah. around with one of my teammates who was like, if I do not see auroras during this time that I'm here, I'm definitely coming back. I have to see this. Uh, <laughs> I have to experience it. So it's really, it's really beautiful. And you were relieved twice. One, because you did see it, and two, you didn't have to go back. No, I understand <laughs> that. And, and, and Mike, as a photographer, did, what was the night sky like without any light pollution? The, uh, the sky in Antarctica is unbelievable uh, for two reasons. First of all, no light pollution. But the other critical factor is um, no air pollution. There's no dust. There's no aerosols. There's no air pollution. And the air is so clean. It's about 100 times cleaner than the air anywhere else that you can find on the planet. So, um, you know, the sky, we normally associate the sky with being blue because of dispersion. Well, in Antarctica, uh, for the most part, the sky is black because there's no particles in the air to actually disperse the light and make it blue. So the clarity is just astounding. So if you're into watching the stars or looking at the night sky, as well as the auroras, uh, you're in for a real treat, definitely. Sure. Number two, I've heard a rumor that if you want to find meteorites, the best place to go is Antarctica because they come in as black rocks landing on white snow. Easy peasy to find, you can make a fortune. Did you ever get to find any meteorites while you were there? Uh, unfortunately, the Sanar station is not in a location where the uh, snow conditions are conducive to finding meteorites. Uh, the reason is that meteorites come in at high velocity, so they actually go well below the surface when they impact. And then you rely on the fact that the ice is a glacier, it's moving. So over a period of 10 to 50,000 years, the motion of the ice in certain areas brings the meteorites to the surface. These, these areas are quite well known now. And then, yes, you can find them easily. So the chances of finding a meteorite directly after impact is very low, probably, in fact, never. So we, we never spotted any. Awesome, awesome. And Thomas. Any words of encouragement for our learners who are watching the session and, and would like to become engineers? What would you like to uh, share with them? Uh, Steve, uh, the foundation, it's, uh, it's math science. That, uh, that's the most important thing, yeah. Just say that again, maths and science, in case they didn't hear it the first time, yeah? It's, it's maths and science, yeah. Yes. Uh, interest, <laughs> your interest in science, so that's the basics. Okay, and, and of course, because this is a SciFest event, people must know that we've got lots more of these sorts of things coming up. And if these sorts of things interest you, our panelists are always happy to answer questions. You can always contact the SciFest people and they can put the questions to Sansa because Sansa, they're actually very nice people, despite the fact they go live in cold places. They're not cold within their heart. Their hearts are warm, their minds are warm. And I can tell you that just through my interactions with Sansa, they are doing cutting edge stuff. And I think that uh, it is amazing that if you are interested in maths and science and technology, then you must please follow the SciFest Facebook page. More of these things are coming up for all those young ones who want to see science experiments every Friday afternoon at three o'clock. Our very good friend, Dr. Janita Pritchard, all the way from the USA, is coming live on Zoom for you to do science experiments with things that you find lying around the house. So on that note, I would like to say thank you so much to John, to Mike, to Mpati, to Thomas, and of course, Catherine, who's hiding behind the scenes there. You can switch on your camera so that we know that you are there just in case. And of course, the uh, SciFest technical team, Freddie and the crew who are passing through questions. I don't know if we've missed some of your questions. If you still have questions, please email us or contact us on the SciFest Facebook page. We would love to hear from you. If you enjoyed this, let us know what else you would like to learn about. And on that note, we would like to say thank you so much for joining us live for this event. And we are going to bid you all farewell.
Let's say goodbye to all our panelists. Bye-bye. You're all waving. Bye. I'm going to try and take a screenshot quickly. <laughs> Five, four, three. There we go. Got you. Excellent. And thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.